got about an hour together, and this is really precious time for you. I feel incredibly honored to be here. And I've got materials we can walk through. I've got all kinds of stuff to use. But what I would like to know first, so I can make sure we use this hour well, is what is it that you really want to talk about? You know, what do you want to learn? Why did you come and give up an hour? Um, and, you know, what would be really important to walk away with? And so if you could help me out a little bit so I can make sure this is relevant and useful, I would appreciate it. So why are you here? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out a way to best get into the study industry. So, uh, nonprofit with a business focus. Tell yeah. me what the industry is. Okay. Great. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in how you balance the interests of the corporate community with something that's completely divergent, like sustainability and, and the environment. Okay. I'm interested in if the different businesses that are part of the alliance, if they feel like they are part of an alliance and why that's important um, for them to be united. How do you go about recruiting new businesses? I'm interested in uh, learning a little bit more about the story of how it was, how it evolved from the Bon Chenard and uh, Patagonia to where it's at today with um, being this massive uh, alliance with different corporations. Good. Other questions? Yeah. Also, how uh, economics and social good can be merged together so they both benefit. Okay. And you're going to find I'm a really easy person, so like if as we're going along you have a question, um, pop it up. You know, just just let me know. And if we can take it right then, we will. Otherwise, I'll throw it in the parking lot and we'll come back around to it. Um, okay, cool. Um, how many of you know anything about 1% for the Planet? Is this totally new? <coughs> okay, so some of you know about us. We are now 1,450 companies operating in 45 countries around the world with a network of 2,800 nonprofit partners. Um, and through our set of companies, their employees and customers, our nonprofits and their members, we have over 50 musicians, athletes, uh, actors, and artists who are ambassadors for 1% for the Planet. We have over 50 media partners who um, talk about 1% in a variety of ways in their publications and in ads. Um, through that, we reach 150 million people a year. Um, so 1.5 million, 1.5 percent of the globe's population. And last year, our companies uh, gave 23 million dollars to the environment. When we talk about it, we talk about it as investment. They found strategic nonprofit partners that help them with their business and help get the impact they want to see happening in the world. Um, in the last eight years, our companies have donated over a hundred million dollars. Um, and so we see this as really the sort of beachhead for innovation. Um, and it's, it's a very, very powerful network. And we're now shifting from a network that's growing. Um, we were nothing, literally, two companies uh, less than 10 years ago. And now we have a network that's practiced in giving, that has relationships in the nonprofit world, is working around the globe. And now we are in our next generation. And 1% uh, for the Planet 2.0 is really taking our network and putting it into action for the environment and for business benefit. And so we can talk a little bit um, a little bit about that. Before I get into that, why don't I just ask um, kind of thoughts after the uh, after the video? Does anyone Yeah? Is it just word of mouth how they find out about it? The all the companies themselves I've sent um, hand up pamphlets and so on or do you all have a campaign to bring in more companies? Yeah, so somebody asked the question about, about recruiting. So this is a really inspirational brand and a very inspirational network, and we do most of our work one-on-one -on -one and word of mouth. Um, so the way that most of our companies come to us, um, and we find out as companies decide to apply, the people who come towards us that we don't go out to, um, they come because they have, um, first and foremost, they've read something about Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, or they've read his book. Um, about a third of the people who come to us have come through that forum. So if you're interested in positive social change, write a book. <laughs> um, the second thing is that um, about 
45% come because they know someone or they admire a business leader or they've had someone that they know from the business community tell them. So we actually we laugh about this because we can tell which members are actually the most active because they start popping up um, as references. You know, Sam Smith told me we have, we have a couple people in our network who are literally responsible for 50 companies coming in because they're so powerful in their own model and example. Um, we have companies that are increasingly coming to us because of the relationship with nonprofits. So, for example, um, last week we were at a dinner for Trout Unlimited. Have any of you heard of Trout Unlimited? Trout Unlimited is a nonprofit organization. They're about $25 million, so a pretty hefty little organization. Uh, they have about 40,000 members in, uh, I can't remember, 170 chapters around the world. Their basic mission is to save rivers that trout and other fish live in and to make sure that people are very excited about being able to get out and fish. Um, they actually have an ecosystem of about uh, two dozen 1% member companies, including Patagonia, who support their work every year. Um, over the last um, four or five years, we've channeled about a half a million dollars to support their work, just through the companies that know them. So they then basically said, hey, we have all these other companies that support our work. Shouldn't they be 1% members? So they actually gathered up all of their corporate um, partners and said, come on down. <laughs> so that's how we end up finding people coming to us. Um, and we have, uh, every day, we get about five member inquiries. So um, we have a lot of people coming into us. And out of those five, uh, two turn into requests for membership, and uh, 20 to 25% of the total folks who come to us turn into members. So it's just a very powerful reference brand. Um, we also go out to people. So we have a set of what we call sweet spot companies. And let me, okay, yeah. Let me just talk about the sweet spot companies for a second. Off. So what we've done is we've said, you know, where is it that there are companies that have a deep connection to the environment, where their owners, founders, employees, managers, would not um, find the premise of investing in the environment ridiculous. Um, and, I, and I tell you this with all seriousness. I walk into companies all the time, and they're like, what's the business case for doing this? Well, if your business is connected to the environment in a clear way, it's actually that makes that question uh, a little easier to answer. So people in the outdoor industry, obviously, food, beverage, people who are in ecotourism, people who are in natural products. We have a whole set of industries that really resonate with us. And so we've tried to find those companies. We also have another set of sweet spot companies who actually are not consumer facing, not in cool emerging new technologies like green tech, but are actually mainstream businesses. If you look at the only sector in the economy in the last five years that's been growing, it's mid-sized companies. So companies that are between five and about 50 to 80 to 100 million dollars. They're people who tend to be regional market leaders. They do most of their business locally or regionally. And they tend to be led by people who have some connection to the community or the region in which they live. Um, those companies, I, I'm going to talk to a timber company and a transport company. They don't have anything really to do with consumer product sales, but they're just people who, they live in one in Northern California, one on uh, the Chesapeake Bay, and they're like, hmm, we think that there might be some connection between our business and the health of the environment. We want to learn more. Um, so we look at these sweet spot companies and we say, um, we're particularly interested in high growth companies, so we, we tend to try to find companies as they're sort of five or 10 or $15 million. So when we first met Cliff Bar, um, Cliff Bar joined with a brand that was less than a million dollars, and the company was about 25 million at that point. They are now 10 times that size, and the entire company uh, contributes to 1% of the planet. And so they contribute several million dollars a year. And as they've grown, our contributions and their contributions to groups through us has grown. So we try to find those companies. Yeah. So I was going to ask in the video, what if ExxonMobil did approach you and they're not in that sweet spot? Yeah, okay. So we, um, we've made some groups evolve as they go through this. So we first started, I mean, literally, the idea of saying to a company, um, you know, you have a supplier development program you invest in every year. You have an employee development program you invest in every year. You have R&D. You have um, product marketing that you invest in every year because those are things that really matter to your business. Um, 
All of your businesses depend on the environment, whether directly or indirectly. But nobody invests in the environment. Why is that? That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, you would never not invest in R&D if your company depended on innovation. You would never not invest in your people <coughs> if your company depended on your people. But most people don't invest in the environment. And so this model was really designed to start people thinking about, from a top-line point of view, what kind of money should go into investing in environmental health, and where should it go, and how should it, how should it end up there. Um, when we first started, we didn't know who was going to walk in the door, and mostly small companies walked in the door, companies under a million bucks. Um, but then we started to get these really interesting, very cool brands that were growing really quickly. We now have 1,450 companies. So we have, you know, Cliff Bar, Patagonia, New Belgium Beer. Um, we have companies like Clean Canteen. I don't know if any of you are Clean Canteen users. Um, so companies with great design, great products, and they also are in a community of like-minded people who've been making pretty tough decisions about taking a percentage of their revenue and investing it in something that they can't fully control. Um, so they've, they've really made, they've stepped up. And when you, you know, whenever you start investing for our large companies, it's 100000 to a $1 million a year. You really pay attention. <laughs> and even for our small companies, I mean, we have one company that they were a $2.5 million company. Uh, they grew to $4 million, and the recession hit them, and they had to go back to three. And so they had basically $10,000, $20,000 that they could take away from their 1% commitments and invest in their business in a tough time. And that company and their employees actually decided to keep their 1% commitment because they felt it was a really important way to signal to themselves and to others that they really cared about making this investment. And it was a very big deal. So, question about Exxon. Sorry, this is a long way around. Problem, problem. But um, at first we would have said, Exxon wants to come in, hallelujah. We now have 1,450 companies who have some stake in each other. Um, and the reputation of each of those companies affects the other. So despite the fact that Kim, who sits on our board, said, come on down, ExxonMobil, we now have a process in place that we might say no to ExxonMobil. And the reason is because the company's intent and reputation really affects um, the reputations of everyone else in the network. Um, we actually right now are, are looking at a company, and so it'd be interesting to get your perspective on this. So this company is um, a large family-owned, privately held forestry company. Um, you know, they cut down lots of redwood trees. Um, they are were the first member of the Sustainable Forestry Council. So if you look at SFC, was the group that was started by the environmental community as uh, the standard setter for what sustainable forestry practices should be. Um, the timber industry set up SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, which was industry-led sustainable forestry. So these guys are genuine players. They have incredible practices on their land. They do amazing things to protect biodiversity, and they're big investors in groups like Trout Unlimited. But one of our questions is, should they walk in the door? Will they add a net positive to the reputation of our organization? We now balance that in the um, And we really, we don't spend any time seeking to convert people who are not good players. It's not our job. We have way too many other companies to work with, and frankly, we don't need to. Yeah. Um, could you talk about your sustainability plan, your structure, and what percent goes to sustaining 1% in the employees? Yeah, so let me explain. Um, a lot of people think that we are a group that collects money and aggregates it and distributes it. We don't. So what we do is companies make a commitment to be a 1% member. Um, they then pick the nonprofits that they want to invest in, and a lot of times we help them. We help them think about strategically where is the best fit between their company, the risks they face, the opportunities they have, and the nonprofits that they want to invest in. Because we think the tighter that is, the longer it lasts and the more value people get out of it. Um, so companies give 1%. So just to make the numbers easy, if you're a $100 million company, you're going to be investing a million dollars in nonprofit groups. We don't see any of that money goes directly. People pay us a fee uh, to be a part of the 1% network. It's like a licensing fee. So in that case, they would pay us about $100,000 to be a part of uh, our network. 
let's see, no, 40,000 if they are. So we earn income that way. The second thing is that we earn income by co-branding products with companies. So uh, Patagonia, Patagonia's outdoor company, uh, Yvonne Chouinard made a shoe. And it was this, he was in camp one night and decided he wanted a little moccasin that he could roll up and put in his pocket when he was up climbing on rocks. And he's done 20 first ascents. So first ascents are literally like the first person ever to be on the top of any particular mountain. So when he decides he wants a moccasin, we figure out how to make him a moccasin. And he designed one, and his company created it, and it's called the Advocate Mock. Um, and what Patagonia does with that is they put on the lip of the shoe, there is a 1% label. Every time a shoe gets sold, we get basically $10 a shoe, um, or a pair of shoes. Then every store has an advocate week. So if you're in Portland, for example, if you were there in July, they had an advocate week where they supported a whole group of sustainable biking organizations. Because Portland has nearly 6% of their population riding bikes to and from work every day, almost three times as much as the next city. So this is one where biking really matters in this community. The shoes that they sold that week, they donated another percentage of the sales to those groups. Now, people say, oh, that's cool, that's good, you know, nice, lovely brand. Here's the business case to it, though, that's really interesting. For Patagonia products, Patagonia products have a very high sell-through rate. That means that when you put it out on the shelf, it actually goes out the door, and you're not discounting it, and you're not basically having to take it back, somebody brings it back. Um, their sell-through rate of the Advocate Mock is twice that of any other product that they have. And a big part of it is because they actually think that their customer sort of hits a really deeply resonant sweet spot with their customer. And they actually make more money on that shoe than they make on just about any other shoe because they sell so many more of them going out the door. Even though they're giving away money to us and they're giving away money to another product. Yeah? How did you get your start with one percent um, I'm going to say one more other thing, and then I'll, I'll come back to that. So, so we make money like that. We also, um, that soundtrack that you heard for that video, we recruited 41 artists, and we made an album. Um, so we've made a couple hundred thousand dollars selling an, al an album you can download on iTunes, and we're going to give you guys download cards so you can get 41 rare and usual songs. <laughs> Um, and we make money that way. And so right now we make about 70% of our money from what we call earned income, and then 30% of it I and another set of folks in the organization raise from foundations and donors. Within five years, we hope that we will be at 90% self funding So that's what we do. And as employees, we've structured it to where we get salary, bonus, benefits. I mean, it's a very nice place to work as a, uh, as a person in the nonprofit community. How do I get my start? Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, so I've um, founded and built out two for-profit companies, and this will be my third nonprofit organization. And so, um, when I was at Business for Social Responsibility, I was employee number three. Um, we are now, BSR is now a $10 million global nonprofit that works advising people about corporate social responsibility, and I ran the environment program. While I was there, I worked with the team from Timberland and Nike. We got to know all kinds of stuff about supply chains. Um, when I left BSR, I didn't know what I was going to do, and I decided that I was going to start a nonprofit to connect supply chains of farmers who were growing food or fiber with brands that were very, very far away with many partners in between. Because I felt like if we could solve a way to do that with transparent, sustainable supply chains and figure out how everyone could benefit one way, we'd probably do a lot of good. So I created a group called Organic Exchange. And when we started, we had 15,000 farmers growing organic cotton for five <coughs> brands, selling about $250,000 worth of product every year. Uh, when I left, we had created a $4 billion market involving about 250,000 farmers around the world and about 5,000 brands carrying the product. So I'd love to do that. And along the way, I met Terry Kellogg, who is the guy who is CEO, who's our current CEO. Um, he was at Timberland running the sustainability program. So I left uh, Organic Exchange, which is now Textile Exchange, when we made our strategic shift to textiles from fibers, um, and said, hmm, don't know what I'm going to do next. I started a local food business. Um, that's my love and passion. Um, I also have a special needs kid. 
And so I had to find a way where I wasn't trotting all around the world. My daughter needs to have her mom in the morning and the evening. Um, and so in balancing all that, I was kind of thinking about, okay, how do I get as local and as specific as possible in an industry that my daughter might be able to work in when she's older? Long story short, Terry called me up and he said, I have this opportunity. <laughs> Would you want to help 1% for the planet scale? And we can figure out a way to do that so that that works for you and your family. Um, and so I said, I love it. So this is, that's what I'm here. So um, I just wanted to say that our So, so the first thing is that, and, and um, I'm going to say this generally, there are some exceptions. But for companies that are over $100 million, if they're really serious about sustainability and about stakeholder relationships, they have a person on board already. And for those companies, we don't offer a lot immediately. And I'm going to explain what we do offer to them. But when you go into them and say, hi, would you like to put a million dollars on the table? Pay us. $50,000, and join a network of companies of which your brand is as good or better than theirs, um, they kind of go, well, I, I don't really need you. And I think that's right. They, they don't need us for helping them with doing their philanthropy. Um, what they don't have and why companies, larger companies, join us, and we just had actually two um, companies that are close to half a billion dollars just join is because when they look at what they can do alone versus what they can do with other like-minded companies, and where they don't have to sift and sort those companies and understand their intentions, and also where they know that those companies have been invested for a couple of years, and when there's nonprofits that have been vetted and tried and other people have worked with them, and there's other support, which we're now adding in, that helps start to measure the effects those start to create, it starts to be a pretty inexpensive proposition. So it's just something where it depends on what they have. For our companies, and again, our sweet spot companies are companies that are 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 million dollars. They don't have CSR people. They're like going like this, ha! <laughs> you know? And they may have deeply held environmental values. They may have people in their organization that have relationships with nonprofits. They may have built the brand doing partnerships with stakeholders, and they still have way more than they want to do when they can do it alone. And so we're very valuable to them in providing them a space for working with others in a very efficient and low-cost way. The last thing is you can do so much with your brand to communicate to your customers what you're all about. When you're communicating through a third party like us, we can help support that and tell a story in a different way than you can tell it yourself. The other thing is when you're in a network of other companies that are doing things, people start to connect the dots. So we just did, uh, we're working with Whole Foods, to look at, in Whole Foods, we have about 25 brands. When you start to see all of them next to each other, and you're a customer, you walk in and go like, huh, ah, that's my life. I could live my life really easily. <laughs> I'd like to live my life really easily. And that's the place that we are now, is we finally have enough companies where people can see their own life. Last thing, and then um, we're now starting to say, we've got 150 million consumers. Between our brands, Clean Canteen, Patagonia, Cliff Bar, and our other affiliated brands, so people like Seventh Generation, um, uh, Aveda, other people are not in the 1% network, but where we have relationships. Their customers are, they're what we call the new consumer. Um, there's a great group in, ah, if anybody is interested in New York, the company is called BBMG. They just announced that they have a New York job opening. This is one of the coolest places in the world if you're interested in marketing and cause-related work. Um, really great company. They've done all kinds of research on the new consumer, and they've created a thing called The Collective. The Collective is it's several thousand customers who are basically co-creating the lives they want with the brands that they admire. And it's a very, very, very powerful model. Um, What's that? 
Yeah, I'm going to just pull up. This is just a little excerpt from some research that they've done. But this is, um, they estimate that this new consumer in the United States is 70 million people. Um, they basically are not the greenest of the green, but they're people who want to look at how they align what they do in every choice that they make. Um, they're very focused on, you know, what's the whole picture? What's the total value I get? How can I help create the solution that I want for my life as opposed to waiting for it to happen? There are people who are really focused on we and the collective. They talk to each other a lot, and they reward and punish companies very actively. So, you know, these customers, and this is like that Patagonia Sweet Spot customer, they come back a lot. Um, I can't tell you which of our brands, but they track these. Um, these kinds of customers buy anywhere from, they're about two to four times as loyal uh, as other customers. They don't always buy more, but they keep coming back and they keep paying attention and they keep rewarding by word of mouth, by tweeting, by doing other things. So even if they're not buying, they're doing other things that are valuable for the company. Um, and these are folks who are really, they talk a lot <laughs> in many forms. So you want to have them on your side. Um, and we're looking at, with our companies, figuring out a way that we can bring in individuals who happen to be customers of the companies and really start to say, what do you want in your life so you can live more sustainably and create basically an innovation lab so that the customers are working with us to say, here's the things I want and I don't have them. And they could be things, they could be services, they could be relationships. I mean, it's not all about stuff. Um, and what kind of businesses come out of it. We also want to work with the same group to say, what are the places in the world that you love? Because in five to ten years, you know, there's five miles in the Madison River that have a 1% <coughs> logo on them because 1% companies and customers protected that piece of land forever. Um, we will have mountaintops, streams, rivers, oceans, sanctuaries, beaches that will have that in ten years. And so we want to really know where are the places in the world that people most value and how can we make sure they're, they're there. Um, and then how can we all work together on public policy? You know, we're starting to do some work with our companies um, to be able to advocate for public policies that actually make sustainability possible. So one of our large companies right now is uh, a big supporter of the ballot initiative in California. If you haven't yet signed, you should. Uh, this is to label GMO products. Because right now, 95% of the products you eat have GMOs in them, whether you like it or not, and whether you know it or not. Um, and this is a chance for people to be able to know. So that's it. And I'm just mindful of time, so let's keep going. Um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you had said that 20 to 25% of the companies that come to you actually become a part of organizations. So I know you said you turn away some people because of maintaining the image of 1% of the planet, but that's a huge percentage that don't end up joining. What happens to them? Oh, the people who don't join? Yeah. Um, so, so we get member inquiries, people who say, I'd like to learn more about 1% membership. And so we send them back a questionnaire and send them information about um, 1%. And then two out of those five ask to actually get a membership application. So that was just like preliminary asking. Right. It's just sort of who's coming in the door, what are they asking about, how interested are they. Um, but that's a pretty high uptake rate. For most organizations, about 5%. So, yeah. Do you do you anything to make sure the nonprofits that are um, receiving the donations are fiscally accountable or are actually making an impact? Yeah. So with our nonprofits, so we've basically been building an organization and alliance of uh, companies. About three years ago, we started to screen the nonprofits. Our our screen initially had just been, are you a 501c3? Are you recognized by your government <laughs> as a legitimate nonprofit? And a 501c3 in the United States, there's equivalents in other parts of the world. Um, we said, are you working in the area of the environment? And it was very broad. About three years ago, we said, you know, we need to really tighten our screen. So we now have a screen that looks at what percentage of time the groups are putting into sustainability, what areas of sustainability they're working on. Um, so, for example, we have a lot of companies that fund the Susan B. Komen Race for the Cure for breast cancer research. That doesn't count for 1%. That's just basically medical research. But the Breast Cancer Fund, which does research on the environmental causes of breast cancer, they're a 1% nonprofit, and they spend 100% of their time looking at that. So we check 
What are they working on? Is it in an area of environmental sustainability? And how much time do they spend on it? Um, that's where we are right now. One of the things that keeps me up at night, frankly, is I go, holy smokes, we will have $200 million in the next five years being invested in nonprofits. And it is entirely possible, not likely, but possible that zip environmental benefit could happen. Um, and so one of the things that we started to do is find partner organizations. We're not developing the capacity ourselves, but we're finding partner organizations who can work with nonprofits and companies to make sure their collaborations have real measurable outcomes. And so there's a group called Social Venture Partners. They work with doing very in-depth work with nonprofits on impact analysis. We're going to be looking at bringing them and others in to look at the network to make sure we're actually getting outcomes from them. It is, for the most part, unrestricted, which is really, it's like liquid gold for nonprofits. Um, some companies, like uh, Roll International, they have a Home Wonderful brand, you know, Home Wonderful and Cuties, uh, Mint, Clementines, and uh, Wonderful Pistachios, yep, there you go. Um, they designate a big chunk of their money to um, a very progressive uh, climate uh, and energy institute at the California Institute of Technology. So that's one where it is general funds, but it's for a specific purpose. Yeah. I was wondering your opinion on the UN Global Compact, and if you feel that their measurement of CSR and ability to maintain that those companies remain accountable is actually effective and just to get a general sense of where you're standing on that. Um, so when I first started at VSR, uh, social responsibility was point of view. That was where it was. It lived sort of off. And VSR was all about actually starting to create a framework of saying here's what corporate responsibility really means. And then things like the Global Compact, GRI, and now actually B Corp um, are starting to put some uh, half behind it. And I actually think of all of the models out there, and this is my personal opinion, take it as personal opinion, not uh, representing 1%. I actually think B Corp is the best model out there because it puts triple bottom line governance in the actual structure of the corporation, and also it has a very transparent process for measuring outcomes um, and reporting on those outcomes. And that's something that is really key. And when I look at are we going to get a lot of change happening, we're partnering with B Corp because we think their governance model, along with our investment model, along with social enterprise investments, are going to create a lot of innovation. And that's something, and then you put consumers and social media over here and the connectivity between everybody, holy smokes, we're going to move really fast, which is really important. And any one piece alone doesn't do it. Like I look at 1% and I think I love what we do. I think we're a great organization. We add a lot of benefit to our members. We have a good network. They're all working together. Cool. It's not enough. But if we can partner with other groups and have frameworks, legal structures, public accountability, you know, ways that consumers can work together to design the products they want, you know, also then start to go like this. I'm going to have two more questions. And just I'll say crowdsource funding. Keep your eye. Congress just passed a huge huge bill, which is going to put a lot of fire into this movement, which allows for crowdsourcing by small investors of investments in social enterprises. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the way you've brought companies together to help leverage their work, are you doing similar type of programming with the nonprofit partners to um, help leverage their impact? Yeah, so we've, we're just starting, starting that. So what we've done is we have our kind of top hundred companies, the most, the largest and also the most innovative, and we're looking at where the issues are that they care about and looking for partnerships. We also have our top 100 nonprofits, which is essentially the same look, the largest nonprofits that have received the most funding, and then also the people who are really driving the engine. And we just mapped them. Um, this year is the first launch of what we call our high impact partnership work which is really focusing in on, okay, where are the sweet spots? Not surprisingly, the sweet spots are on land and habitat protection, um, water, both fresh water and marine water resources. And then the cool areas that are emerging are sustainable transportation, sustainable agriculture, and food. Um, and this whole really interesting sort of social enterprise development space. Um, so. 
other things? Are people, I'm looking at the list, I think we've touched on just about everything um, on the list. This is boring. Other questions? <laughs> if wanna, nobody wants to be the last question. That's yeah. fine. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Any last questions? Okay. <laughs> um, for someone who's interested in entering the corporate community world, what's the best advice you would have um, for us to guess? Like, you know, because I know that for a lot of jobs, you're in, if not in this case, but if it's like a private company and then there's a CSR um, inside of it, usually they hire internally. So if you're just more passionate about that cause and not company itself, what do you think is the best way to get into that? Yeah. Um, okay. There's no best way. So the first thing I would say, and that this is said as an entrepreneur, is know yourself. So like, if you care about something really deeply, do something about it. And either start your own nonprofit, find a group that's really aligned with your group and really move. Um, and that will then create a whole set of energy and relationships around you that will lead you to wherever it is that your next next step is. But I really feel like what I would just say to all of you guys is all of you have an incredible contribution to make, whether it's creating a new company, generating a lot of value, making a lot of social change, doing it all at the same time. Um, and the key thing is know, you know, like, who you are. What do you really care about? What do you really want to make sure happens in the world? And then just get to it. <laughs> because when I look at, I, I don't mean to be cynical, but I, I feel like in the next, you know, 30 years of business life, um, everyone will be creating their own life and their own work. And it is amazing because it um, technology enables it, social networks are going to enable it. It's frightening as hell. Um, my husband, <laughs> every time I create a new venture, he goes, oh my god, you're jumping off the cliff again. And it's like, yeah. And he's like, do you know where you're going to land? And I'm like, not really. Um, I sort of have a sense. Um, and you don't have to do that. But it is, there's not going to be that many places where the pathways are really clear and the door is open. And I wish I could say that. You know, 30 years ago, that was the case. So I would say, you know, find your way. Know what you want to do. Find your way. Find other people who want to do it, and you'll find the path that's there for you. Um, it's really important to know that.